Now we move to our next speaker on the Action Chrétien en Orient from Mission Agency to Fellowship of Churches. Uh, it will be delivered by Reverend Wilbert Van San is assistant professor of theology and mission at the Nidish School of Theology and lecturer in religion at Haigazian University. He is a fraternal worker on behalf of Kerki Nakti, the mission department of the Protestant Church in the Netherlands. He studied theology at Utrecht University and obtained his PhD from that university in 2018 on a thesis about partnership in mission in the 20th century. Wilbert was part of the ASEO Fellowship on behalf of the Chesebe, just mentioned by Tharwat, which is the other mission agency within the Protestant Church in the Netherlands. Yes, Reverend Wilbert. Thank you, Reverend Paul, and thank you, Dr. Tharwat Wachma. I could uh, present and say, well, something similar happened to the ASEO and then stop, but <laughs> actually there, are, there were some differences and I'd like to bring those out. I would like to share my screen with you uh, so that you have some idea of uh, you know, visuals as well. Before I start presenting, I would like to thank Mrs. Elisabeth Muchler for her research in the Ar ASEO archives, which has greatly helped me in writing this paper. I would like to thank Reverend Nicolas Tromper for providing some photos, uh, which you will be seeing on the slideshow. And I would also like to thank Reverend Thomas Wild, who presented yesterday for his patient and passionate work in the ASEO Oral History Project, which has been an important resource for this whole conference. In October 1995, a group of people gathered in the town of Kesab in northwest Syria. They represented Protestant churches in Syria, Iran, Lebanon, France, Switzerland, and the Netherlands. While most visitors come to Kesab to enjoy its beautiful mountainous scenery, its clean air, and hospitable hotels and restaurants, these people came to sign a solemn agreement in which they committed themselves to the ASEO Fellowship. It was a sign of the dawning of a new phase in the relationships between Protestants in the Middle East and Europe. The chief objective of this fellowship was described as developing the partnership and interaction among members being on an equal footing in a spirit of responsible sharing and through common service in their respective regions. This is to be done, especially through programs that have a missionary or witnessing character. Like the original ASEO constitution from 1922, the fellowship constitution of 1995 dovetailed physical healing and spiritual outreach what was different, however, were the answers to the following questions. Who will engage in service and witness? Where will they do that and how? In this presentation, I will briefly trace the process of transformation of the ASEO in three stages, from European Missionary Society in the colonial era to mission agency during the phase of decolonization to transnational fellowship of churches in the post-colonial era. First of all, the ASEO as a missionary society during the colonial era. In structure, the ASEO, when it was first started, closely resembled the 19th century missionary societies, which have just been described by Dr. Rahman. It was a voluntary society which depended entirely on the spontaneous efforts of a group of Protestant individuals, mission friends. Just like other organizations of its kind, the ASEO's endeavors included relief, social work, medical work, schools, and evangelism. And just like the other agencies, the ASEO took a mission station approach, which was especially evident in Aleppo where the first buildings 
of the mission compound were completed in 1933. In other respects, however, the ASEO was very different from other Protestant mission agencies. First, the ASEO was not a unilateral evangelistic initiative of visionary Europeans, but first and foremost, a compassionate response to deep suffering, especially the suffering of the Armenian people. Secondly, the ASEO intentionally cooperated with the local churches. The ASEO formulated its goal modestly as service to the Christian cause in the Orient. And it was no surprise that the ASEO immediately began to employ members of the Armenian and Arab Protestant communities. A good example is the ministry of Reverend Nerses Khachadurian the already mentioned and maybe unsung hero of the ASEO, who entered the service of the ASEO in 1932, served as a missionary to Arabic speakers, at first in Aleppo and later in Jazeera, and in 1968 was relo relocated to Iran to serve the Armenian evangelical community there. I don't know how many years of service with the ASEO Reverend Khachidurian had, but he must rank high up there with Reverend Paul Beron and others. Thirdly, and this has been elaborated by Dr. Philippe Bourmeau, the ASEO had a trans-European character, which was embodied by almost all of its early leaders and missionaries. And because it had this transnational character, it was much less prone to what the British church historian Adrian Hastings has called missionary nationalism. I could give many examples uh, of the early leaders, but I will, I will not do that. But I will say that in addition to you know, these people embodying a transnational or trans-European character, this transnational character was further accentuated during World War II, when the ASEO was cut off from its constituencies and survived thanks to the help of the orphaned Mission Fund, which was the largely US donated IMC Solidarity Fund for missionaries cut off from their home base. And so, although the ASEO followed the pattern of 19th century Protestant missionary societies, it was quite different in that it was primarily a trans European response to deep need characterized by a desire to work in close cooperation with the local churches. The ASEO as mission agency during the time of decolonization. A major shift in the relations took place uh, in, within the ASEO and the churches took place in the turbulent 1950s, which was quite similar to what was sketched about Egypt especially true for Syria, where anti-Western sentiments and suspicions of missionaries were on the rise. This resulted in a drastic reduction of ASEO presence in Syria. To give three examples, the Dutch nurse Maria Zier had her residence permit revoked after only a few months in Syria for unclear reasons. Swiss missionary Elena Achtmann, who was mentioned yesterday, had her residency permit not renewed on allegations of proselytism. And another Swiss missionary, Alice Ulmer, was expelled from Syria after four, four years of working in Aleppo because of alleged defamation of Islam during a presentation in Switzerland. Only Anne-Marie Beck was allowed to stay as she was married to a Syrian, Mr. Elias Tartar, and had the Syrian nationality. All these things made it clear that the traditional mission station approach had to be abandoned and the work had to be transferred to the local churches. This was not just a matter of strategic securing of continuity. I would like to stress that. It was also a missiological principle which had been formulated back in the 19th century, or as missiologists like Roland Allen argued, 
could even be seen in the ministry of St. Paul the Apostle. So after a process of negotiations, the ASEO reached agreements on the integration of the work in Aleppo, especially the Church of Christ, with the Union of Armenian Evangelical Churches in the Near East, 1959, and in 1962, an agreement on the work in Jazeera with the National Evangelical Synod of Syria and Lebanon, where the ASEO had helped form Christian communities, constructed churches and parsonages, and had started a school in Hasek. It was not easy for the ASEO to let go of their work in Aleppo and Jazeera. In the first draft of the agreement with the Synod, Reverend Paul Beron proposed a partial and staggered transfer. He suggested that the ASEO field secretary would be a member of the Synod, the ASEO missionaries would be council members of the local Presbyterian church, and that the ASEO from Strasbourg would have a say in the appointment of staff in the Jazeera mission. The pain can be sensed in Paul Baron's words in the first draft of the agreement. And I quote, the Action Chrétienne en Orient is at work in Jazeera since 1936 in order to give a spiritual help to the Christians in this neglected field. Three communities have been founded by its efforts. The ACO did its work in an unselfish way. Nothing was bought or constructed in the name of this mission. All was done in the name of the local churches. The ASEO is now ready to hand over the whole material, moral, and spiritual responsibility to the Arab Protestant Synod. We, representatives of the ASEO, ask the Synod to understand that it is not easy for us to withdraw from a work and field for which we have brought great sacrifices and prayed very much." End quote. Understandably, the Presbyterians could not agree to ASEO's proposal. By mouth of the secretary of the Synod, Reverend Ibrahim Dagger, they responded that the proposal of joint administration contradicted with the principle of ecclesiastical autonomy and self-governance. In addition to that, the political climate, Reverend Dagger wrote, dictated that the church be perceived as truly national. Instead of a model of gradual and partial devolution, the Synod preferred full transfer of the work and, of course, continuing cooperation with the ACO. The ACO accepted and, after some soul searching, realized that claims of historical ownership, suspicion of the churches and controlling attitudes had to be relinquished. As Roger Burnier wrote, Total confidence between mission and the churches was the only guarantee of continuity. The integration gave the Armenian Evangelical Churches and the Presbyterian Church full authority over the mission work and responsibility for the missionaries. They were now called fraternal workers and were to be received by the churches as their proper members. And again, as Dr. Rahba has sketched, not only in the Middle East, but also in Europe, the mission came closer to the churches and was integrated. In 1963, the Swiss ASEO committee became part of the Département Missionnaire of the French-speaking Protestant churches. In the Netherlands, the Morgenland sending entered into a close cooperation with the GZB. And in 1994 was finally fully integrated and became, became a department of the GZB, a mission agency that was a branch of the Netherlands Reformed Church. The formation of the fellowship in the post-colonial era. The new form of cooperation that had been forged in the 60s remained unchanged for three decades. Much work was done in those 30 years. People and projects in Lebanon and Syria, the Church of Iran was supported. For some years, the ASEO was active in Algeria. A number of French, Swiss and Dutch theologians 
were delegated to the Near East School of Theology in Beirut. But at the end of the 1980s, this model of church-based integrated mission came under criticism of being unidirectional. True, it secured equality and a degree of mutuality, but it did not provide enough space for reciprocity. A group of young pastors from France and especially Switzerland, some of whom are present here among us, believed that it was not right that the ASEO acted as a financial father to the churches of the Middle East. They had been students during the revolutionary 1960s and some of them had gained ecumenical experience in the Seva community. This was the former Paris, Paris mission which had been transformed into, into a community of churches on equal footing in the 1970s. These young pastors realized that the ASEO too could move to a deeper communion. So after five years of intense negotiations, the ASEO Fellowship was officially launched in Kesap in 1995. The constitution was a distinctive attempt to overcome the donor-recipient relationship. It first formulated some essential basic tenets of the Christian faith that were the guiding principles for the fellowship. And out of these beliefs flowed one single aim of the fellowship, to give a common witness to Jesus Christ. As means of this common witness, it identified partnership, sharing and cooperation. These terms were explained in more detail in two clauses about the flow and encounter of people. The fellowship encourages the exchange of personnel. This exchange happens in all directions from partner to partner. The fellowship encourages mutual visits that may become opportunities for real meetings on spiritual, community and personal levels. These shall be organized on all levels in a creative way so as to include lay people, youth and women. Reciprocity among the member churches of the ASEO was now a priority. All were involved in giving and receiving, and this was expressed in multiple ways, a common basket and a common budget. All member churches, including the European ones, were expected to submit proposals. The Kesap meeting also put in motion a steady cycle of mutual visits, including regular youth exchanges, where my journey with the ASEO started, which had already been pioneered in the 1980s, it must be said. And Reverend Cho Lee will say much more about this in his presentation, which will follow shortly. To conclude, the history of the ASEO, from missionary society to integrated mission agency, to a fellowship of churches is a textbook example of the developing ecumenical partnership theology. As we have seen, as a missionary society, the ASEO was characterized by a humanitarian, compassionate spirit and a transnational orientation. This helped the ASEO to embrace the new structures and the changed relationships between Middle Eastern and European Protestants. These processes and renewed structures safeguarded equality, mutuality and reciprocity. But perhaps these new structures were less suited for the exchange of people. Maybe they were not such good channels for the exchange of people. The 19th century missionary society with its long serving missionaries and mission friends had harnessed this Protestant voluntary energy in effective ways. Now there was less space for this spontaneous, untamed missionary initiative from the grassroots. Yet this is the lifeblood of Protestantism, the priesthood of all believers. It is the heart of the individual rather than the structure of an organization that observes need and responds to it. This then, I submit, is the challenge for mission fellowships like the ASEO in the 21st century. 
find a new balance between institutional and durable partnership on the one hand and voluntary, spontaneous and effective initiatives on the other. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Reverend Dr. Wilbert Van If you may all uh, mute your... Yes, thank you. <laughs>